My name is Jen Adams. I'm the Senior Director of Strategic Academic Partnerships at the American Association of Colleges of Pharmacy. And I often get the question of, which school do you work with? And the answer to that is all of them. Um, I work with all the pharmacy schools in the country. We try to facilitate their work and make their lives a little bit easier by centralizing things like we work with PCAT. Um, we also run FarmCast. So things that would be really challenging for a school to do individually, we sort of do those things on a national perspective and try to provide those services. So um, just to give you guys a little bit of context that I don't work with a particular pharmacy school, I get to have the fun pleasure of working with all of them. So what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about interviews and talk about what you need to do to be prepared for interviews. Um, and and some of the steps that might go along with that. So can I get an idea and a little bit of a sense of who's here? How many of you guys are um, applying this year for fall of 2014? Okay, handful of you. How many for fall 2015? Okay, a few more. How about to fall of 2016? Okay, all right. Any go-getters 2017? Like you've been in school for two weeks. Awesome. Welcome, ladies. <laughs> So just wanted to get a little bit of a sense. For those of you who are here and you are here a little bit early, I commend you um, in terms of being here to learn and to be prepared for what you're going to experience. So um, definitely a good thing to be prepared earlier rather than later. So this particular slide um, I like to put up because I think it says a lot. And I'm sure some of you guys are asking, why is there information up there about professionalism when we're here to talk about interviews? What's the deal? So my thought on this is that everything that is encompassed within professionalism is important for your interview because when you come on the day of your interview, you want to be as professional as possible. And so we're gonna talk through a little bit about professionalism and get you sort of that big picture idea of what you want to portray on your interview day. And then we're going to get into sort of a little bit more of the nuts and bolts and get a little bit more focused on some of the actual specifics of things that you can do to be prepared for your interview day. So up here you see the 10 traits of a pharmacy professional. And these 10 traits are actually from a white paper that was written a few, quite a few years ago, actually, about what are the traits that are necessary to be a part of a profession, and specifically the pharmacy profession. So you'll see up there, the first thing, you, you've got to have knowledge. You've got to have knowledge and skills of what you're doing to be a professional. So you've got to be good at the science part, right? So then the next thing that it talks about, though, is a commitment to self-improvement. So when you think about healthcare, do you think it's stagnant or do you think it changes? Changes. And it changes every single year. So no matter what health profession you're interested in, you're going to have to think about that and you're going to have to think that you are going to be a lifelong learner. So whether you're a pharmacist or a physician or a PA or a nurse practitioner, it's going to change every year for the rest of your career. So there's always going to be more that you can learn. So you need to have that commitment to self-improvement and being a lifelong learner. The service orientation. How many of you are, want to go into healthcare because you want to help people? Every single person rose their hand. So that makes a lot of sense. The service orientation is a really important piece of any healthcare profession. Uh, pride in the profession. Each of us on the healthcare team play a different role. I am really proud to be a pharmacist and to be part of that medication management piece of the team, that healthcare team the person who provides the treatment expertise to the healthcare team. So am I skilled at diagnosis? Nope, because I'm not a physician. I have a specific role that I'm gonna play on the team and I know exactly what that is and I'm proud to be able to play that role because I wanna be able to help people. So that service orientation comes into play. The covenantal relationship with a patient. Does anybody know what the word covenantal means? It's okay, I didn't know either. No, no one knows, it's generally a little bit of a legal term. But what, the, what, what covenant means is a covenant is a two-way promise. A little bit different than a contract, it's a two-way promise. And we encounter this a lot in healthcare. I can be the best pharmacist ever, and a patient can walk out and go home 
and eat McDonald's every day for the next month and then come back and say, why is my cholesterol so high? So I've done my part. I've completed my part of the promise to try to help make them healthier, help improve their quality of life. But if they don't do their part, then we aren't going to have optimal outcomes. We aren't going to have more positive outcomes for our patients. So that covenantal relationship is really important. Creativity and innovation is definitely important as well. We are looking for people to come into our profession who are creative and who are innovative, who are looking for new solutions to the healthcare challenges that have been around for years. So we need people who are thinking outside the box to come up with some good solutions for that. Conscience and trustworthiness is also really important. You need to be someone who's going to show up on time. If you're not there, the pharmacy can't open because the licensed pharmacist needs to be there before the pharmacy is open. That's a really important piece. And it also relates into ethically sound decision making, which is another one of the points about who a professional might be. And those ethically sound decisions are those that are generally things that are a little bit gray where you and I might have a discussion that I'm going to say black and you're going to say white and we're both going to be right. So conscience and trustworthiness, ethically sound decision making, all really important pieces. You have to be accountable for your work as well. If you aren't accountable for what you've done and haven't documented what you've done, did it really happen? Did that patient's quality of life really improve if you weren't accountable for doing the right things for those patients? So in terms of the professionalism piece, I wanted you to have sort of this big picture perspective of what we expect you to be when you're in pharmacy school. We expect this of you when you graduate and become a pharmacist. So we want you to be thinking about this big picture in terms of what you're going to convey about who you are and why you would make a good pharmacist and why we would want you to come to our program. So this next slide, I think, is an important piece for a lot of us to consider is the social media aspect of professionalism. Uh, there are people out there who call it e-professionalism as well. And this slide really is it's depicting, it was originally written for people looking to develop a social media policy at a university, as an employer, that sort of thing. But you can see there that there's things that happen in your online presence of who you are that inter overlap with the professional side of your life. So there's the personal side and there's also the professional side. So am I saying that you can't have an online presence? Absolutely not. Am I saying that you can't be who you are in that online presence? Absolutely not. But if what your online presence conveys is that you go to a party every two, three days and that you are drunk every two, three days and all of the pictures have you with a beer in your hand, then we have an issue. And you better believe that there are admissions officers who are looking at your online presence. And so a lot of people, your first thought is, well, I'm going to make my Facebook profile really private. Well, what about what you tweeted? How many, some of you guys will recognize, but we search Farmcast, the word Farmcast, every day on Twitter to see who's talking about Farmcast, to see if there's questions that we can answer. You'd be surprised how inappropriate things are that are said about Farmcast. I've seen profanity. I know it's not an easy process to fill out your application, but do you want to swear about it in a way that goes out to the whole world to see just by searching the word Farmcast? I might not be one of your followers, but I can see it because it's out there on Twitter. So something to think about in terms of who you are conveying about who you are. And you don't want to convey something about who you are that when you get to your interview day, they already have a different perception of who you are because of your online presence. You don't want to ruin it before you even get there. And so that's why I think this piece is really important. So what do you guys think professional programs are looking for on your interview day in terms of professionalism? Go ahead. How you dress. We will talk about that much more in depth that we will really talk about what you convey in those first few minutes of a first imp impression based on what you're wearing. Somebody up here? Go ahead. Communication. Commun how you communicate. Communication is very key. And we will talk in depth about that while we're here, about the, the mistakes that you can make and then the good things that you can do in terms of your communication. 
Anything else over here? How you carry yourself. How you carry yourself. If you guys had come in and I was sitting in a chair back here with my arms across my chest, and I might have just ruined my microphone. Pardon me. Uh-oh. Sorry, microphone guy in the back. <laughs> if I just blew out your ears. Um, if I was doing that, what would it have conveyed to you when you came in? That I didn't care? That I didn't really want to be here? And that I was really uncomfortable with the idea of talking to you? So the way that you carry yourself and your body language is really important. And we'll talk about proper body language and improper body language as well. Any other thoughts in the white? I'm sorry, one more time? Arrive early. My dad always says that if you aren't 15 minutes early, you're late. That's a very good idea when it comes to your interview. Because if you show up and you're frazzled because you were almost a few minutes late, what are you portraying about yourself? And this is something that I still need to work on because I'm habitually five minutes late for everything, but that's definitely a really important piece. In the green? Same thing. Punctuality, very important, absolutely. So what are the things you're gonna do when you prepare for your interview? And there are a lot of different steps, but there's one step on this slide that I think is really, really important. And this is my big clue for you and the one thing I want you to write down, because this is the one thing if you walked out of this presentation that I would want you to remember is that when you go to your interview, you need to be prepared with some messages about who you are. You need to be prepared with two or three talking points about who you are, why you want to be a pharmacist, and why you will make a good pharmacist. You could even add to that why you would be a good fit for that particular program. But I want you to think about the answers to those questions before you go to your interview. I want you to have written down the answers to those questions in a way that clearly articulates who you are, why you would be a good pharmacist, and why you might be a good fit for that program. I want you to have practiced those things. You'll see later on, we're gonna talk about practice, practice, practice. It's so important that you've actually done this ahead of time. Because if you haven't, you run into some of the traps that we're gonna talk about. And I've seen it happen a few times with some folks out on the quad earlier today, where they, I've said, well, why is it that you're interested in whatever health profession they were interested in? Well, um, like, I really just have loved healthcare since I was a child, and like, I really want to be a pharmacist. Did I clearly articulate anything about why I wanna be a pharmacist? Do I know anything more about about that particular person if that's their response. So um, practicing ahead of time so that you're prepared, so that you aren't making some of those mistakes is really, really important. You also wanna think about how the whole interview day is gonna be structured. Who are you going to be talking to? Are you gonna be interviewed by students? Are you gonna be interviewed by faculty? Are, is the dean or the associate dean gonna come talk with you about the program? And what do you wanna convey during those time frames? How are you gonna change and tailor your message if you're talking to students versus if you're talking to the dean? Those are two very different conversations that you might have. One other thing to think about too in terms of the way that the day is structured, there's probably gonna be a tour of campus and there's probably gonna be a student ambassador that's gonna be on that tour teaching you about the campus and telling you about the program. And what if on that time, you're talking bad about the program. Do you think that student's not interviewing you just as much as the person sitting across the desk was an hour earlier? There are those sorts of things to think about in terms of the message. How can I have a more casual conversation with someone on a tour, still represent myself well, and not do something stupid? Because that's when the most common place that something stupid happens is on the tour with another student, that you say something that you really wish that you could take back because that particular student's gonna go right back to the director of admissions and say, guess what this person said? So it's something to think about. Are, is there gonna be a multiple mini interview? Is it gonna be a situational based interview? Is it going to be two faculty and me and I have no idea what they're gonna ask? Get as much information as you can before you go so that you can be prepared to have those conversations. And the last little piece of this is to think about the program. 
learn about the program, learn about the university, learn about the climate. I heard some really good questions out on the quad earlier. Someone was talking to one of the schools that's in Arizona and saying, it's really hot there, right? Help me, help me know what the climate is a little bit more like. If I don't like to be hot, maybe I don't want to go to school somewhere where it's really hot all the time. Or if I hate to be cold, Minnesota might not be an option for me. But think about those things, learn about those things ahead of time so that when you get to the interview, you can use that opportunity to find out more in-depth questions about the curriculum, about the class sizes, about what their, learn their teaching style is versus your learning style. To ask those really in-depth things because you've covered all that basic stuff by looking at the website. The next couple slides, we're going to talk about some common mistakes that people make in their communication. And I'll be honest, as I'm presenting, I keep thinking about some of these common mistakes. And I might have been counting the number of times I've said um, or the number of times I've said gonna, because that's a thing that I say. I say gonna instead of going to. Those are not things that you want to say during your interview. You want to present yourself in the most positive light. I want to stand up here and be a very articulate speaker who knows exactly what I'm talking about at all times. You want to do the same thing while you're in your interview. So you want to practice before you go to try to avoid saying things like, like. Um, do do is another one of my favorites and it kind of makes me laugh whenever I hear anyone say it because I think, haha, they just said do do. And then I'm completely distracted and I have to come back to <laughs> get back to the conversation. So you don't want to make those sorts of mistakes. The other one on this slide that I think people think, well, does it really matter how you say Tuesday? If you say Tuesday or if you say Tuesday, does it really matter? If you have a very thick accent, it can matter. So depending on how you say different things, it can really matter in the way that you're portrayed at your interview. So if you have a very thick accent, it may be something that you want to work on. I have quite a few friends who are from the southern part of the United States who spend a great amount of time trying to make sure that when they're in a professional situation and professional conversations that they don't say y'all, right? Because what do I say, portray about myself if I say y'all the whole time? So just some things to think about. Now, especially if English is your second language, something to think about in terms of your accent. Here are a, a handful of other common mistakes that people make uh, historically in the past, because historically is in the past, so let's say it twice. How many times have you heard someone say irregardless? This is a very common mistake. Irregardless is not a word. It's regardless. There is no such thing as irregardless. And another one of my favorites is the, if I can be honest with you. Does that mean you weren't honest with me 10 minutes ago when we were talking? That you're only being honest now? And this is the only time that you're going to be honest? What do I know about what you're going to say to me in 10 minutes? There are filler words as well that people use, like if I can be honest with you. And we'll talk a little bit about some that are very appropriate filler words to give you a chance to collect your thoughts and prepare an answer to a question, but then there are some that are not very good filler words. Um, I watched a patient consultation with a student pharmacist recently, and this student pharmacist was awesome. He came in and he connected with his patient. He had the best communication skills I've ever seen, but he had a really kind of funny filler word. He said awesome to everything. So when she com complained about a particular thing that was really bothering her, his response was, awesome. <laughs> his body language was appropriate. His facial expressions were appropriate. But he said, awesome. So that's another thing to think about, is those filler words that you might use in a conversation. How often do you nod and say, mm-hmm, 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 mm-hmm? Is it too much, too fast, too often in the conversation? So this particular researcher at Yale University, Marianne LaFrance, said that 90% of first impressions are based on four specific things. First is your tone of voice. Second is your appearance. Third is your facial expressions. And fourth is your posture. So if 90% of a first impression is based off of these factors, does, do any of them have anything to do with what you're going to say? Nope. 
So 90% of the impression that the school's going to have of you is going to be based on how you look, how you carry yourself, are you confident, what's the tone in your voice. As a presenter, I have a very actually high-pitched voice. I have a three-year-old voice. I sound like a small child. When people call my house and they're a phone solicitor, they ask if my mommy is home. And I'll be honest, I might have messed with one or two of them and been like, no, and the stove is on, and I don't know what to do. <laughs> but I, I really did tell them I was an adult, because then they're going to call 911. But in those particular cases, my voice, if I were talking in my normal, everyday voice to you, it wouldn't come across well to you. I have to deepen my tone while we're having a conversation. My husband has the exact opposite problem. He has a really deep voice that is actually at a pitch that's hard for some people to hear. So when he gives a presentation, he has to raise the pitch of his voice so that people can hear what he's saying. So each of you is going to have something different to think about in terms of the tone of your voice. But it's really important to think about that, that piece of it. You can probably also hear as I'm talking that there's a little bit of a smile behind what I'm saying, right? That impacts my tone. So this is just some, some things to think about, about what you're going to convey about yourself. I actually gave this presentation earlier, and I asked, and someone in the room actually knew who the picture was, and I was incredibly impressed, so I'm going to see if I should be impressed again. Does anybody know who the guy in the picture is? It's OK. No one ever knows. This is Chief Justice John Roberts. So one of the things that I think is really interesting is that this picture depicts sort of that mental processing that we do around a first impression. So you can see here that your first impression, for some people, might be the only impression that you make with them. You might meet someone so briefly during your interview and only have a second to make an impression on them. And a lot of it's going to be based on what you look like. The first seven seconds of any first impression are based solely on the visual impression. And then the first five minutes are based on audible. But that first impression is based on all of those other pieces. So if you look at this picture of Chief Justice Roberts, they're saying here that he has a smooth forehead, so he's youthful and unconflicted. He's Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States. Do you think he's unconflicted? I don't think so but his picture is conveying it. But he's probably not really unconflicted. You also see here, based on what he's wearing, he's wearing robes, the judge's robes. So he looks like he fits into that role, right? And it's just really interesting as you look at those different pieces about what they're saying, about that he's approachable and has nice eyes. So he must be approachable. Now, some of these things you can't change about yourself. Unless we all get Botox right before our interview, I'm not going to get rid of these wrinkles on my forehead. You know, it's, it's just not something that I can change. But there are things that you can change. And there are pieces of your visual first impression that you can control and some things to think about. So we're going to talk in a couple of different ways about how to modify that visual first impression. I also think that this is really interesting about how a message is received. What would you think was the most important part of your message? when you're writing it down. The content, right? I'm going to write the most important words and say the most appropriate thing, but content is only 7% of how a message is received. 38%, again, is our tone of voice. And then 55% is from our nonverbal body language. We talked a little bit about this. If I had my arms closed across my chest, that I would appear closed. How about, and I'm going to run around this real quickly to show, how about if I'm a guy? And, and guys, this is your com most common mistake, the fig leaf. Do I appear very open? I, I appear that I'm on the defensive. As I'm having this conversation with you here in the room, I'm, I'm using my hands because I speak with my hands. And I get teased sometimes by my husband, of course, who's a bit of a jokester, that I have T-Rex arms. <laughs> you don't want T-Rex arms during your interview. So this is where practice comes in. Whatever you do, because we all have something that we do, you want to think about how it's coming across in terms of our body language. Are we open? If I'm in an interview and I have to sit across from someone, that's a defensive position, sitting across from someone across the table. How do I make myself appear less defensive? Where do I put my feet? 
Do I angle away so that I don't look as if I'm defensive while I'm sitting having this conversation with them? So just some things to really think about as you're practicing and figuring out how, what body language is gonna fit and what's gonna work best in terms of that, that interview that may be an all day interview. I know when I interviewed for the pharmacy school that I ended up going to, it was from eight until five. And I was exhausted by the end of the day. I knew it ahead of time because they did prep us for that. But I, I really didn't think about how my body language was being portrayed in that last hour. And I'm pretty sure it was like this because I was really tired from trying to be poised and ready to have the right conversations and say the right things the whole time that I was there. So in terms of effective communication and a first impression, there's a lot of things, a lot of positive things that you can do with your body language and with the way that you approach the situation that will come across much better. So first of all, smile. Look like you're happy to be there because you're excited that they want to know more about you, right? You're excited that you might have the opportunity to go to school there, so convey that in your face. Appear excited about being there and be happy and greet them with a cheerful smile. Always start every conversation with each person with a handshake. How many of you guys have had a dead fish handshake, handshake from someone? You guys know what I'm talking about, this one? Right? When you shake hands, and I'm gonna borrow my colleague up here and kind of demonstrate here for you. We'll do it across the table. When you shake hands, you take your hand. This part of your thumb is gonna go right into that same part of her hand. I'm gonna grip her hand and I'm gonna shake it. I'm not gonna shake her arm off <laughs> and I'm not gonna squeeze her hand really tight, but I don't wanna be a dead fish. I, I'm gonna portray a lot about who I am just in that simple handshake. So when you come in, first time you see someone and the last time that you see someone, you come in, you shake their hand, you go out, you shake their hand. And when you shake their hand, especially the first time, you look them in the eye and you say, it's nice to meet you. There are cultures out there where it's not appropriate to look people in the eye. But in this country, you have to be able to look someone in the eye and it's a challenge for some people. So if you have to practice that ahead of time, Practice it ahead of time so that when you're conveying who you are, you come across as confident. Um, be punctual and be prepared, I think has been a key message over the last little bit here for us. But I want to add to being punctual and being prepared in terms of your communication with the folks that are scheduling your interview and confirming that you're going to be there on that day. I've seen this happen a lot of times where someone accepts an interview, confirms that they're going to come, schedules the time, and then they have an interview at a different school, and the next day they get an offer from that school, and maybe it was their top choice program, and they are so excited because they got into their first choice. And then they don't call or email and say, I'm not going to be there next week to that other program who's scheduled for them to be there. And they've invested a lot of time, a lot of effort energy, money, into you being there on that day. And when you don't show up, it says an awful lot about who you are as a professional. If you change your mind and think that you're gonna wanna go there again, you better write that one off because it's not gonna happen because of the way that you acted in terms of not following up and communicating with them. So in addition to being punctual and being prepared, be very professional in terms of your communications and interactions with the pharmacy schools. And the secretary who answers the phone talks to the director of admissions. So when you have these conversations, just like Facebook, don't ruin it before you get there by being rude to that person because they're gonna tell the director of admissions exactly what happened. We're gonna talk more about dress in the next couple of slides, so we'll get into much more detail. When you're sitting and you're answering questions, one of the hardest things to do is to actually listen before you talk. And it's something that you're probably going to need to practice. I've seen a lot of cases where it's a complicated question and a student might only answer half of that complicated question because they stopped listening after the first half. Or they only got one little piece of it, thought that this was what the person was asking, didn't listen to the rest, and answered something completely different than what they ultimately asked. 
and they go off on a tangent, and then by the end of it, the interviewer's like, I don't know how to score that because I don't, they didn't answer the question. Don't eat or drink a lot before your interview. If your interview starts first thing in the morning, don't drink a glass of milk before you go. You're gonna get the phlegm from the milk and you're gonna be <coughs> clearing your throat the entire time. Soda will do the same thing. The only thing I would suggest is water. Don't have eaten a big full meal and you're, you've got the, the itis, the afternoon itis, where you're sleepy. Try and think about those things before you come. What am I gonna eat before I go? What am I gonna drink? Am I gonna carry a bottle of water with me during the interview day because I'm gonna be talking a lot and I know I might start to need to, to have some water to be able to clear my throat? Um, and then the last one is just show enthusiasm. Be obvious in your body language and in your facial expressions. Your enthusiasm for pharmacy and your enthusiasm for that program. So this is the part that no one likes to talk about. And don't worry, gents, you're on the next slide. But we'll start with the ladies. I'm going to be very direct with you guys. And I'm going to tell you some mistakes that I've seen even today out on the quad. Ladies, your hair, if it's in your face and you're constantly doing this, pull it back. I'm not saying everybody has to have a bun in their hair. But get it out of your face so that you're not fiddling with it all day. In terms of your blouse, if I see the line of cleavage, it's too much for an interview. Now, I'm not saying that you can't be yourself and can't show your own personality. I'm not wearing a suit today. There are a lot of presenters that you've probably seen wearing a suit. My personality is not one that I like to wear suits. I might throw a jacket in a really formal situation over my dress, but I almost always have on a dress because that helps me to feel feminine and show that I can be a woman in a working world and can still be very successful and be feminine at the same time. And that fits well with my personality. Find something that fits with you. But if I can see your cleavage, I'm not going to notice anything else about you other than your cleavage. So don't show me, OK? Skirts. I know that the fashion right now in terms of skirts or dresses is minis. And I think they're very cute. And you should absolutely wear them to the club, but don't wear them to your interview. Or to the pre-help fair, where you're talking to directors of admissions who are going to remember you the next time they talk to you when you apply to their program. I've seen a lot of this today with the ladies that have realized that my skirt was maybe a little too short. And I know this sounds funny, but your skirt should hit your knee. I know it's probably not going to fit with all of your fashion sense, but your skirt should be close to your knee. Maybe an inch above, but not any more than that. Because what you portray about yourself shouldn't be about how great my legs are. It should be about what's in here and why I'm a good pharmacist and why I'm going to be good at taking care of patients. Can you imagine some of the skirts I've seen today with a white coat over them? You wouldn't even see the skirt. You would just see the white coat, right? How awkward would that be if you walked into your pharmacy and you were like, is that girl wearing a skirt? <laughs> What's under that? Very, very important to think about. Pants. Um, by all means, if you are more comfortable in pants, then wear pants. Whichever fits for you. Skirt, dress, pants, wear whatever fits for you. Make sure your pants are long enough. Make sure also if you are a girl and you wear pants that you don't stick with your leg spread. It's just not OK. You still have to sit like a lady, even though you are not wearing a skirt. And then the last part, and you'll notice here on the slide, it's kind of small and a little bit hard to read, but it says that your heels should not be taller than two inches. No hooker heels, ladies. I've seen them. You can't walk in them. You're uncomfortable. And by the end of the day, you really just wish you weren't wearing those shoes, that your legs might look great. But it's not a good idea for the interview. Even if you wear flats. It's not a good idea for the interview to have really tall heels. You can have a heel. You can wear flats. You can do all those things in between. But, but be conscious of that and be conscious of what your shoes are going to portray. Also, another area where if you want to be able to show your personality, as long as you don't break that two inch heel rule, a great place to show it is in your shoes. You could have on the most fun pair of shoes with a sparkly bow if that's your personality as long as they're not something that's causing too much attention to go to the shoes. But that's a good place in a subtle way to be able to show my personality without 
breaking some of the other rules. Gents, you didn't think you were going to get out of this, did you? <laughs> Guys, if you have a really cool hairdo with lots of gel that's kind of in a little bit of a mohawk that I've seen is a little bit of the, the fashion, um, probably not a good idea for your interview. Just don't do it. Not too much gel. If I can imagine touching it and thinking that you're going to hurt my hand and it might be bleeding when I come away from your hair, probably not a good idea. At least not for the interview day. You can, you can do it a little bit later when you're in school, but on the interview day, you're trying to put your best foot forward. So really think about what you're, what you're conveying. Your shirts, they need to be pressed. My husband tries this all the time. He throws the shirt in the dryer with a dryer sheet, hoping that he won't have to actually iron it. And then he comes out and he's like, am I good? And I'm like, nope, take it off, got to iron it. You got to put your best foot forward. If you've got on a nice shirt and I can still see the lines from the package that you took it out of because you didn't iron it, I've seen this, not a good idea. Your tie. Guys, this is a place that you can show your personality. Just don't be too loud in your personality, right? Not Just like the shoes, not too crazy. It's a good place. I will say though, I'm one of those that I look at the pharmacy tie as being a little bit like So, something to think about, seen it? Your pants, match your shoes to your pants, guys. If you're wearing black pants, wear black shoes. If you're wearing brown pants, wear brown shoes. Don't do the reverse. And please don't wear white socks. If you wear white socks with your black pants and black shoes, that's the only thing that some of the interviewers are going to be paying attention to is the fact that you have white tube socks underneath your suit. So please don't make that mistake and have it draw away from what you really want to convey, which is why you want to be a pharmacist, what, what good fit you are for that particular program. Remember, we're coming back to that message again. So thinking about what you're wearing. And guys, a suit is probably your best bet. I think it's a little easier for guys sometimes than it is for girls. If you don't want to wear a suit, you could probably get away with a sport coat and a pair of slacks, but realistically, you need to have some type of a jacket. Can you maybe get away with a shirt and tie and pants? Maybe, but is that really what you want to convey? You want to have something a little bit more, uh, a little bit more formal. Airing on the side of formal for guys is much better. So when we get to the actual questions, we want to talk about what are the ABCs of the Q&A that we're going to have? So ABCs are that we want to answer the question. You want to bridge that to your message points. Remember our message points of why we're a good fit for the program, why we would make a good pharmacist, and why we're interested in pharmacy. And then you want to conclude on a positive point. Make sure that the last thing that you say is one of those sort of sound bites that they, if they were going to take a quote out of your interview and say this is who you are, you want it to be that positive point that you include on. And that ABC is important, but the other piece that is also just as important is that piece at the beginning of this slide that says take a breath, take a minute, and decide what you're going to say. You're going to get asked some very difficult questions when you're at your interview and you want to answer those very difficult questions in the most appropriate way. And sometimes that means you're going to t need to take a minute to think about it, right? So stop, take a deep breath, pause. And there are some examples on the slide of things that you can say that are good fillers. That's a very good question. Take a breath, then give my answer. Nothing wrong with taking a minute to be able to answer the question. Even if you feel uncomfortable, it's probably less noticeable, that pause, to the interviewer than it is to you when you take that pause. So take that pause, take that second, and say, thank you for asking about that, because that's something that's really important to me. And then talk about what it is that's important to you. It's a good way to give yourself a second to collect your thoughts. Use their name. Well, Dr. Adams, and in the idea of using their name, there are some pharmacy schools out there that are less formal than others that the students call the faculty and the administrators by their first names. And that definitely exists, but I would encourage you to not do that, to err on the side of being more formal. It's probably more appropriate to call them doctor unless they say, oh no, call me Jen. Starting out a little bit more formal is going to give a better impression of who you are as opposed to being less formal and then being offended. 
If you're not sure if they're a doctor, if they're maybe a Mr. or a Ms., call them doctor. Err on the side of being more formal and have them say, oh, no, I'm not a doctor, but thank you, and then moving on in the conversation. So err on the side of being a little bit more formal as opposed to less formal. So as you're answering the questions, be sure that you listen and then do your ABCs, answer the question, bridge to your message, and conclude on a positive note. Stick to the topic as much as you can and stick to your messages that you want to convey. Don't go way off on a tangent. And an interview is not the time for TMI. Don't overshare. There's a way that you can tell a story that gives a message that doesn't give the entire picture of exactly every detail that happened in that particular situation. So think about that. You don't want to be an oversharer. <coughs> and then the last piece is practice, practice, practice. If I could have filled up the entire PowerPoint slide with practices and not had it look really ridiculous, I might have done it. And I might have tried it as I was making my PowerPoint. But practicing is probably the most important thing that you can do as you are preparing for your interview. So whether it's practicing and writing out the information, writing it all down and practicing it in front of your mirror by yourself, or whether it's asking your friend, hey, would you mind? I would love to be able to have some time to practice before my interview. Many of you guys probably have career counselors at your universities that would be willing to sit down with you and practice. I know that we have rotation students, so students that are doing their advanced pharmacy practice experiences that come to our office. And there are elective rotations that they do in our office where they learn about what it's like to be a pharmacist who works in an association. And often we have those students as they're getting ready to apply for residency programs. And so one of the things that I've offered for those as they're going through that process is that I'm happy to let them practice their interview with me. So they'll come and they'll wear what they're going to wear that day and they'll come to my office and we'll sit down and we'll practice in terms of the interview. And the most common mistakes I've seen is that sometimes people wear clothes that might not fit as well as they should and they're a little tight and so by the end of the interview they're feeling like, oh, I'm really uncomfortable in this. And then they know, don't wear that on my interview day because I'm really uncomfortable in this particular outfit. You want to, as you want to be in your most responsible outfit and you want to feel like you look good and you want to feel comfortable. So make sure that you practice in an outfit that meets those, uh, those criteria. And then the other thing that I've seen in terms of these little practice interviews that I've done with, with students looking for residency programs is the questions that they mess up the most are the easiest questions. Things like, so tell me about yourself that they haven't thought about that. They've thought about all the other hard things that they might get asked during the interview, and they aren't really ready for this, so tell me about yourself. And they don't necessarily have sort of their canned 10-second elevator speech about who they are. And sometimes it's an appropriate situation to go back to kindergarten and talk about this experience that you had there, but in most cases, don't go back that far. Give me a brief synopsis of who you are. My name's Jen. I'm originally from Idaho. I'm a pharmacist who works for a nonprofit association in the Washington, D.C. area. There's my 10 second elevator speech about who I might be. I didn't go all the way back to kindergarten. And if you do that and you're in a group of eight people who all have to say who they are when they say, tell me about yourself, and you take up 15 minutes to tell them everything about you, what does that do for everyone else? So, Something to think about in terms of your practicing and practice those easy questions. Um, and definitely know the answers to questions like what we talked about at the beginning. Why do you want to be a pharmacist? Why is pharmacy a good fit for you? And why are you a good fit for that program? So think back to those, those messages. Those are some of what I would consider the easier questions to answer, but we get students that mess those up. And a couple of examples of how students mess those up. Well, I was really interested in healthcare, but I wanted to go into a profession where I didn't have to touch people. Okay, let's talk about social work. And even then, you still should probably touch someone. If they're crying and upset, putting your hand on their arm is going to go a long way. <laughs> Good luck giving a flu shot without touching someone. Another one of the common mistakes that people make around that is, I wanted to go into pharmacy because I can't stand the sight of blood. 
Okay, well, I appreciate that, but someone, when you're working in a community pharmacy, is gonna wreck on their bike out in front of the store and come in with blood running down their leg, and there you go, now you've just encountered blood. And the first time you rotate through an emergency room, you're gonna be in a lot of trouble if you don't like the sight of blood. You're probably gonna be on the floor passed out. So maybe pharmacy might not be good for you. Common misconceptions about what pharmacists are and what pharmacists do that come into those conversations. So what can you do to avoid that? Learn about what pharmacists are and what pharmacists do before you go so that you are prepared so that you don't make any of those common mistakes. So um, I don't know that we have a lot of time for questions, but thank you guys for coming. Remember, practice, 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 and you guys will all be stellar and fantastic at your interview day. And if anybody has specific questions, I'll be here for a few minutes afterwards. Thank you.